Okay, it says we're live on Facebook, but it's here it says we're still setting up to go live. So I don't know what to believe. Well, there's always something. There's always something. Uh, if, if it says we're live, we'll assume we're live. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. It's uh, Tuesday, 4 o'clock Pacific, 7 o'clock Eastern, midnight in Ireland, 1 a.m. in Italy, 8.30 and 9.30 a.m. Wednesday morning in Australia, and it's Facebook Live. <laughs> and this is the most enjoyable Facebook Lives of the month for me, because I get to be with Michelle. And we, yay. <laughs> yes, right? Good, 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 good. Yes. Um, so welcome everyone. And Marzi just got me here on my phone so I can see that Jillian is the first one and says, you're live. Well, thank you, Jillian. That's really great to see. And um, so we're off and running. And this is our Q&A. So let's start, Michelle, with, um, we, we've got some questions that have come in. Is that right? Yes, let's start with this one because I find I come up against this a lot. So we get a dairy zoomer back and they're like, but I don't eat dairy. And then we talk a little bit more and they're eating butter. And somehow there's a disconnect for a lot of people that butter is not dairy or butter is okay. So I just would love to um, be able to discuss this. You bet. You bet. And uh, it turns out that for Marzi, she can have butter, but she can't have any other dairy. Uh, uh, and that's both from a symptomatic uh, 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 that she doesn't notice any symptoms with butter, where she immediately, even if there's the tiniest amount in something like a salad dressing, you know, not a creamy dressing, just a sal um, a light little amount of dairy in this huge container of salad dressing. She can't have it. She'll get sore throats and cough from it right away, but butter doesn't do that. The problem with butter is that now immune responses are usually from the proteins, usually from the proteins. And butter has very little of the casein, the protein called casein that is um, in butter, but it's very little, a very small amount. If you put a stick of butter on a stove on a really low heat and let it just slowly melt, you get this amber liquid uh, in the pan with this white crud on the top. That's the protein, that's casein. And people can usually have ghee who cannot have uh, butter or any other dairy. Um, ghee is the clarified butter. When you order lobster in a nice restaurant or crab legs or something, they give you that clarified butter. It's, um, uh, it's the fats of uh, butter without the protein, the casein in the butter. One exception to that, if you have elevated antibodies on a blood test when you're looking for dairy sensitivity, if you've got antibodies to um, um, milk, milk butyrophilins, right? The milk butyrophilins, they are the little bit of protein that's in the fat molecules in butter, this tiny amount of protein, thank you. Tiny amount of protein that's in the fat membranes of the uh, butter. And if that's called the butyrophilin, so if you have antibodies to that, you can't have any uh, butter or ghee. Uh, most people can have the ghee. So few people can have butter on dairy sensitivities. Michelle, do, do you want to add to that? No, that was great. And I agree. And butyrophilin can be so beneficial because it's rich in butyrate. Like you said, right? It feeds the cells that line the gut. So if ghee can be a fat that's added into the diet for variety, for healing those cell membranes, for feeding the lining of the gut, it can be a really great add. Um, and it doesn't, it shouldn't, if it's good quality, have any um, dairy uh, proteins from the dairy, right? But I just think if, there's a big disconnect between um, people like Marzi who have dialed it in and know that she doesn't have an issue with butter and she's she doesn't have symptoms and she also doesn't have um, 
elevated antibodies on a test. Right. A lot of people I'm seeing have elevated antibodies on the dairy zoomer. And so it's not doing them any favor, right? It's actually causing inflammation. Right. For those who are new to the concept, there is a category of tests to look for food sensitivities called the zoomers. We talk a lot about the wheat zoomer and then the dairy zoomer. And the technology of these tests is cutting edge. Mayo Clinic's written a number of papers on them and, uh, and how accurate they are, like nothing else on the planet. No other laboratory test has come close to what's called the sensitivity and the specificity of what the Zoomer test um, uh, can produce. And there's the wheat Zoomer, the dairy Zoomer, the lectin Zoomer, the egg Zoomer, the corn Zoomer. There's a bunch of different Zoomers. Now, I always thought when you go to the doctor and you get a blood test done, that's the result. What they look at on that piece of paper is the result. And I never thought about those tests could be wrong. And when I got in practice, I think Michelle, you said you did the same thing that sometimes with our patients, I would do a couple of tests. You know, I do one blood draw, take two tubes out, send it in under different names, and it would come back with very different results. The exact same blood, but different names. And that showed me not to trust the laboratory test as the gospel that um, you use them as guidelines, but not as the gospel. Now, with the technology of these Zoomers called silicone chip technology, it's the gospel. They, they talk about 97 to 99% sensitivity and specificity, which means every time, right on the money, as long as your immune system is working adequately. If you're immune, and thanks to Michelle, she's the one who really pushed this. So now the two, big laboratories in the world that are doing cutting edge testing, which is Vibrant for the Zoomer test and Cyrex for the tests that came out 10 years ago now that are still head and shoulders above all the other labs. They both now will check total immunoglobulins because Michelle made a stink about it. <laughs> again and again, she made a stink. And you know, um, people listen to the doctor.com, right? And so, the laboratories listened and realized they needed to accommodate this. And because we we're getting too many tests that came back negative, but the person said, but I don't feel good when I eat wheat. So well, how's that possible on these tests? And then we checked and we found that their immune system was very weak and it wasn't the right move to ask the immune system, is there a problem with wheat here? It was just the wrong move to do. Uh, I'm going to do a few shout outs and then ask and then ask Michelle if you want to um, add to that. So Sophia's here. Hello, Sophia. Steph's here from Missouri. Uh, Lena's here Lena's watching. Nancy's in Buffalo. Mike is. Uh, uh, hi, Michelle. Mike from Rock Rockland. Hey, Mike. So glad you're here. Yeah. Kat's here. Kat Johnson. She has a question, actually. All right, Kat, let's go to your question. Last week, you spoke about a shield that can be put in our bedrooms to shield against 5G. What type of shield would this be? Um, there's a couple of different things, Kat. Um, there's a paint that has been put together that apparently um, uh, reflects um, and doesn't allow um, these uh, 3G and uh, apparently 5G also uh, from penetrating the paint on the walls and you, you paint your walls with this paint, you should be able to find it online. Um, um, the the go-to guy that I always look to is uh, uh, Pino. Um, oh, oh, what's his first name? Uh, Nick, Nick Pino. Uh, uh, we, we had him on Facebook Live about a year and a half ago, and he wrote a book about EMGs and We'll pull up his website and see, we'll see if we can find his website and post it here for you. Um, uh, but he's my go-to guy. He recommended the, the uh, uh, meter that we have on the doctor.com. And because people ask us, what meter should I use to be measuring EMFs in my house? And there's a bunch of meter, meters out there. So I called Nick and he said, well, this is one we use. 
and this is why, and he went through the technology of it. Uh, so he's my go-to guy. And that's P-I-N-O-I-T, Nick, P-I-N-O-I-T. And uh, uh, when I thought about clothing to protect you when you're flying from EMFs, for Marzi and I, I called Nick and I said, so what about this clothing that's got silver in it? And he said, well, you know, there's some suggestions that it might be helpful, but there's not any really good hard evidence of it, but I bought it anyway. And Marzi and I always wear these uh, boxer shorts and this t-shirt and the socks. They're white and they've got little silver, and it's, it's silver, actual silver that reflects EMFs. Now that's more information that you need to know that I wear white boxer shorts when I'm flying maybe. <laughs> but but um, um, so it is, so it is. Michelle, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, that's great. And I, I was trying to find um, a website that I had to search for people who will come into your home and do like a home inspection and give you guidance on if you have um, those smart meters right outside your bedroom, um, whether they're gas or electric or what you can do for like the least amount of money, but the most effective to turn at least your bedroom into like a sanctuary, a safe zone, right? I mean, there's basic things we can do like turning off um, Wi-Fi at night that can have huge benefit to at least allow those hours when our body's detoxifying and rebuilding cells to be free of the assault of Wi-Fi. But um, uh, yeah. So Marzi uh, just sent a text and it threw me off. <laughs> I was paying attention. So I'm going to show um, my, uh, my, my computer froze for a minute. Yeah, you were you disappeared on me, but you're back now. So that's good. <laughs> um, there's a comment from Melissa. Ghee is so yummy. I developed beef antibodies in addition to dairy. Wondering if I have an issue with the B proteins in the cell membrane. That certainly is possible, Melissa. Um, and if you want to confirm that, the uh, dairy zoomer. Uh, Michelle, does the dairy zoomer look at the milk butyrophilins? Yes. Great. Okay. It's really the most comprehensive to look for a dairy sensitivity. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, Kim asks the question, do you recommend a colonoscopy or does it destroy good bacteria if we have leaky gut? Um, Colonoscopies after the age of 50 save lives. So when it's a question of people dying or damage to the microbiome that they're gonna to have to rebuild for a few months, I go on the side of rebuild the microbiome. So yes, people should do colonoscopies. Um, if one is normal, maybe every five years or so, um, certainly not every year, unless there's a reason for that. You know, it's a great story that uh, uh, Marzi, uh, before we met, um, she lived in Ireland and uh, the healthcare there was uh, covered. So she went and had a, a feminine exam and they came back and said, you know, you've got some abnormal cells here, come back in six months. And so she said, okay, maybe she's like 19 or 20 and she came back in six months and it was abnormal again. And she had to do that seven times that they kept having her come back every six months. They didn't give her any recommendations and, and uh, uh, well, I'll correct that. They said, uh, do you smoke? And Marty said, well, you know, every once in a while I have one cigarette. Well, that can cause this. So Marzi stopped smoking. And, uh, uh, they asked, uh, do you, what was the other one they asked? Uh, drink excessive amounts of alcohol. And Marzi said, I'm 19. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and no, no, I don't, but I'm 19, right? And he said, well, excessive amounts of alcohol could maybe cause this problem. And then one day the doctor left the room and she picked up her file and looked at it and saw that the notes were cervical cancer, stage two. And it just shocked the hell out of her. No one ever told her. And her grandmother had died of cervical cancer. So she immediately went on an investigative hunt 
online. She was studying nutrition at the time in school and asked her uh, nutrition instructor about this and said, well, give up gluten right now. So she Googled gluten and cervical dysplasia and found some studies on that. So that's when she went gluten-free was that day. And when she went back again for the next checkup, because this was seven in a row every six months, when she went back again, it was completely normal. And the doctor said, it's completely normal. I'm glad you followed our recommendations. And Mars, he said, you didn't give me any recommendations. I went gluten-free. Oh, well, that didn't have anything to do with it. That's what the doctor told her, right? So some people just don't know. They, they just don't know. So the, back to the colonoscopy, you bet, you bet. At least um, once when you're 50, um, and that's a negotiable age. If you have a family history of colon cancer, you might want to do one when you're 40. And then if everything's normal, ask that doctor, but certainly at least every five years, um, do it again. Michelle, do you, do you want to add to that? Absolutely agree. And sometimes before the age of 50, if somebody has calprotectin, it's a marker of inflammation in the gut. If it's off the charts, or elevated, we recommend going in and talking to a gastroenterologist to see if you know it's indicated because we could be screening for uh, ulcerative colitis Crohn's, right? And there's so many things. So yes, is it fun to drink that solution? And is there a chance that the beneficial flora could be impacted? But sometimes we have to weigh the pros and the cons. And in this case, um, there are certain times when it's, I think it's critically important. Agreed. Donna's here from Prince Edward Island, says hello, Dr. Tom and Michelle. Susan's here, Alice is in Virginia. Christine says, then why doesn't the general practitioner doctor use those tests? That's really a good question, Christine. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm originally from Chicago and that was the home of Second City. And one of the original characters in Second City, which was the precursor to Saturday Night Live, some of you know of that. And one of the original characters in Second City, uh, there was uh, John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd and Gilda Radner. And one of Gilda Radner's characters was Roseanne, Rosanna Dana. And uh, one of her, Classic comments is, you think? You think? So how come my doctors don't do these tests that are so accurate? You think? I mean, it's like, it's just common sense that they would do these. But unfortunately, there's a lot of politics. If you're dealing with hospitals and medical centers and groups of practitioners that the most cutting edge proven science, proven, this is not theoretical science, but proven science, sometimes it takes a back seat. And I've said in many presentations that the average, Christine, the average, not the exception, but the average delay from when new research called translational research, which means it changes the way you think, from when new research is published before the doctor down the street is using that research, the average is 17 years. So silicone chip technology, which has been out now for about five years, has got another 12 years before the doctors down the street will be using it. Unfortunately, that's true. Shouldn't be that way. And we always recommend people download information about these tests from our website take it to your doctor and say, please order this test for me. And then just watch what happens, if they'll do it or not, and then what kind of gobbledygook they'll give you as to why they won't do it. I mean, we have, I've got five, six, seven papers from Mayo Clinic about the technology of this test and how accurate these tests are. And they refer to it as a new era in laboratory medicine, that's their language. It's a new era. Well, the old labs don't want to hear that because they're not going to spend the millions of dollars to change all their equipment and pay the royalties for the doctors who designed these tests and came up with the technology. They're not going to do that. They're going to keep doing what they're doing, the old tests. That's unfortunate, but that's the politics of medicine. Uh, and they're not 
covered by insurance, Dr. Tom, you know, and so we, many of us tend to get stuck in this mindset that insurance covers everything we do. And we have to think of medical insurance like car insurance. We have it for the catastrophic events, right? I mean, so much insurance right now doesn't cover anything until you've racked up 7,500 or 9,000, right? And mm -hmm. so some of this is an investment in our health. I mean, I do the wheat zoomer on myself at least once a year as a report card to make sure my gut is healthy, that I'm not getting exposure to gluten because we don't always feel it brewing. So Go give it to a school teacher. <laughs> 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 That's great. That's really great. Uh, Colleen says hello from Naples. Terry says hello from San Diego. Teresa's in Rochester. Ruby's in PL. What's PL? Um, I don't know what PL is. PI? P. Maybe PI. May, maybe it's a capital I. Marty's in Austin. Wendy's in the UK. Wales, UK. That's Answer. right. It's a late yeah. night for Wendy. Thanks for being here, Wendy. You bet. Dorada's in New York. Sign, sign, sane, S A I N E, sane is uh, hi, Dr. Thomas Shell. Thank you for this session. You're welcome. Gabriella's here from Peru. Hey, Gabriella, nice to he see that you're here. Thank you so much. Uh, April has a question. Hi, Dr. Tom. I'm dealing with uh, diverticulitis 24 7 last year. Episodes used to occur every few months before the that, but now it's chronic. I eat carefully, no sugar, gluten, dairy, anything unhealthy, and I take butyrate supplements with each meal, but can't seem to clear it. Concerned about my colon health. Any thoughts on root causes or healing strategies? Thank you. April's in Toronto. So I'm going to be direct here, April, and then I'll, I'll let Michelle take over. Um, you're, sounds like you're doing everything that you've heard about to do, uh, but there was a surgeon in London, uh, around the turn of the century, the, from the 1800s to early 1900s, very famous surgeon, he was knighted, his name was Sir Edward Bach. And um, a friend of his came to him that had gallbladder problems and Bach said, well, we'll take your gallbladder out. Guy was in severe pain, he said, no, 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 I don't want surgery, it's last resort, I'll see if I can do something, if need be, I'll come back. Bach didn't see him for a while, and then he saw him again. He said, hey, what happened to that gallbladder? He said, oh, I went to see this so-and-so person and my pain's all gone. And Bach, what, what? And it turned out that this person was using essential oils and they used a particular combination of oils to make almost a homeopathic remedy out of these oils. And Bach was so blown away by this, thus, he developed the Bach flower remedies. And if you Google B-A-C-H, the Bach flower remedies, you see the whole world of what these oils do. They work in our bodies in such a subtle way. But the way Bach characterized them, this is a very brilliant man, and he characterized them by the condition. And he associated the Bach flower remedies with the emotional state of the person. And gallbladder, bitter, you know, you, you take bitters to help your gallbladder because your gallbladder makes bitters. Bile is bitter to break down fats and things. It's, it's a bitter. And when you need help, you take some extra bitters. Those with heart problems, they have heartache. Those with colon problems, they have a shitty attitude, excuse me but they have a shitty attitude. So what is it about this resistant colitis in your life that is making your colon inflamed where its job is to get rid of the leftovers? What is it in your life of leftovers that you need to get rid of? And excuse me for being so direct about it, but you know, you're suffering a lot. And I want you to dive into this for yourself and find out. And if you need some help, if you need some professional guidance, our friend, Michelle and I and our team, we did a uh, uh, Four Pillars event uh, a couple of years ago. 
in San Diego and people flew in from all over the world. Uh, we had 15 people that flew in and spent two and a half days with us, one, one and a half days, and it changed their lives a lot. And uh, we brought in um, a guest professional to talk about this topic of, and you've heard me say before, and if you haven't, I'll say it now, that you have to look at health from a pyramid perspective. There are four sides to a pyramid. It looks like there's three, but there's four. There's a base. That's the home of your structure. That's the home of chiropractic, massage, uh, original osteopathy, pillows, um, yoga, exercise, your bones, your muscles, your ligaments. That's the base. There's the biochemistry. That's what you eat and drink and breathe. There's the electromagnetic and there's the emotional or spiritual. And the emotional or spiritual is just as potent as any other side of the pyramid. And Michelle, out of the 15 people that we had in that first week uh, in Encinitas, how many of them had the spiritual or emotional side of the pyramid of health come up where they realized that was the big emergency break holding them back? How many of them? All of them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the structure we did, you know, we were talking and I would just start downloading and then, then we had these two director's chairs and I'm sitting there and I said, all right, who wants to be first? You know, and the person comes up and sits down and we have all their health history we reviewed ahead of time. And all right, Steve, what's the emergency break here? Think of the four sides. What's the emergency? Well, I really haven't been completely gluten free. And, you know, every once in a while, you know, and they would recognize that, you know, they can't do that kind of stuff. But then after a while of doing this during the day, a person would come up and sit down and say, okay, Kathy. And all of a sudden, Kathy starts crying. Right, Michelle, do you remember? People started crying immediately. And I'm not smiling out of entertainment. I'm smiling because it's so powerful that it changed their lives, that they felt safe enough in this environment to just get some guidance and to go with the flow of this. Changes your life. So when you have someone that's got colitis and they're doing all the right things and it just go, it won't go away, you have to look to one of the other sides of the pyramid of health that may be contributing to the problem. It can be a bad relationship that you're in, suppressing you. It can be um, emotional trauma that in, in your history. Um, there may have been abuse in the past, I don't know, but there's something. And the person we brought in that day to help with this was Dr. Silva Dvorak our friend, Dr. Silva, and she's great. And she works like we do, you know, on Zoom and Skype. So it's drsilvadvorak.com, D-R-S-Y-L-V-A-D-V-O-R-A-K, drsilvadvorak.com. So in terms of your 24 seven diverticulitis, meaning that your gut's inflamed, April, you might wanna look to the emotional spiritual side of the pyramid um, and investigate that one. Michelle, do you wanna to add to that? And I think that was really well said. I just, everyone I work with, I say it's emotions, all of that plays a role. It may be 20% for you, it may be the 90% for you, right? But it's going to be playing a role in, um, getting well. So mindset and doing something every day to reduce stress, right? Because we're a very stressed out 2020 right. and like heightened stress response for everyone. And so really being conscious of that and being proactive is really critical. Agree. Um, Sane has a question. I've been taking your GS colostrum. Good. I, I take it too. Since calves only drink this for four days, how long would it be safe and beneficial to take this? Also, what could the dangers and signs of overdosing on GS colostrum be? Really good question. And the colostrum we have 
is, I'm really proud of it. It's best in the world, literally. Um, three countries in Africa license it as the treatment of choice when someone's diagnosed with HIV and the government pays for it because it's inexpensive and it does so much to help keep the gut healthy. And uh, I, I've thought the same way that you do, Sane, I'm S-A-I-N-E, Sane, H-S-U, Sane Su. I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Uh, but I've thought the same way you have, and I've had these discussions with my friend, Andrew Keach, who started the company that makes this Colossum. Andrew does one of these containers every day, half full of colostrum, adds water to it, and just shakes it up and drinks it. Not a scoop, it's like half a bottle of this every day. And he gives it to his kids every day. He said, Tom, my kids have never been sick. You know, and he talks just like a dairy farmer would talk because he was born and raised as a dairy farmer. Kind of looks at you and says, my kids have never been sick. Okay, Andrew, I guess that means it's working. <laughs> Good point. And I'm of the opinion now, um, I take it every day, every day that I have a smoothie. Uh, you know, I'd like to be uh, philosophical, say, well, mammals only drink it you know, for the first four or five, six days of life, um, why would humans be any different? And uh, well, humans aren't drinking breast milk, you know, uh, 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 every day. Uh, no animals drinking breast milk every day. They wean off of the breast milk, but colostrum has so many factors that are turning the genes on to heal your gut in so many different ways Andrew came up with that concept. He said, you know, Tom, there are many, many players that really help um, heal the gut, like glutamine and vitamin D and fish oil and turmeric. There's a lot of good players, but only colostrum plays the entire symphony. Just, just like a dairy farmer, you only just pauses and looks at you, right? So <laughs> it's always great to talk to Andrew. Um, so, that's my current thoughts about it. Michelle, do you have any thoughts you want to add to that one? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, really beneficial. And there's just a few times that it's um, not recommended. I think not in pregnancy, right? Um, that's, that, that is correct. Yeah, but um, it can be really beneficial. Now, if somebody has a really severe dairy allergy. There is serum derived immunoglobulins that don't have that dairy, but many people can tolerate it even with a dairy sensitivity. Right. Uh, uh, Teresa, Teresa asks, what do you recommend to build the microbiome after antibiotics because of surgery? Michelle, do you wanna start with that one? Sure. So um, on the next Sunday or the next day that you have some time, go get 20 different veggies and make sure that you have all the colors of the rainbow and they have some leafy greens and some root vegetables and just variety is key and then wash them all pulse them in a food processor divide them between glass jars stick them in the fridge and then pull them out uh, in the morning and dump it into the blender with some water and glunk 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 you're getting all of that fiber and all of those phytonutrients um, to feed the microbiome. So start with food. Right. Start with food. And if you can't handle it raw, because some people can't, because their gut is a little compromised or for whatever reason, then put it in some bone broth or, um, or some vegetable broth and then blend it up and drink it like a soup. You can put some seasonings in it. Agreed, agreed. Um, We've just started a um, second round. Uh, we decided to do this thing, um, base hits. And so for four weeks last month, every Monday, um, I just answered questions uh, for two to three hours on a particular topic. And it was for people who really wanted a deep dive of understanding. And I had such a good time doing it. I took four topics. The first week was detoxification. Why do we need to detox? What does that mean? 
and we went through it in great detail. The next week was inflammation to really understand it. The next week was your immune system, how to make it your friend and work with it. And the fourth week was um, the gut, my, uh, gut brain connection. And then I did a bonus section, a fifth week of the autonomic nervous system, the, the uh, relaxed nervous system and the fight, flight or fright one and all the effects of that. And it was great. And uh, um, we limited it to uh, not too many people. Um, and still I was going two to three hours uh, nonstop, which was great. I really enjoyed it. We decided to do it again. So we, last night was the first one and they're all recorded. So anyone that wants to um, join, you're certainly, you're still welcome to join all this, um, this week, we're gonna leave it open for people to join, to register. And it's $147 for the four weeks. Uh, and you can watch the one from last night on detox uh, this week and then be current, um, it's every Monday night at uh, I think it's six o'clock my time. So that's uh, five o'clock um, uh, Pacific, uh, eight o'clock Eastern. And last night I went for over three hours. Wow. And, and then I realized the time I said, oh my gosh, it's, uh, I've been at three hours. Okay, folks, that's enough for tonight. And then uh, we'll, I'll see you next week, right? But it's, it's everything I've got, I mean, is, is, is as I know on the particular question. So if you're interested in that, um, I don't know the URL for that. Uh, I think it's the dr.com forward slash, um, I don't know. I actually don't know. We'll find out and we'll post it here. We'll post it. Um, Michelle, you want, uh, uh, there's a, can, can you take the next question? And I'll send a message to Mary Agnes to get the URL. Yes, so Mary says, um, hello from Tampa. What can you share on rheumatoid arthritis? Asking for a friend. So I never know when they say asking for a friend if they really are or if that's the joke because they're really asking for themselves. It doesn't matter. So rheumatoid arthritis can be different for each person presenting with it. And so ideally, it's working with somebody who can help find the root cause of your friend's rheumatoid arthritis. Now, it can be expensive to work with functional medicine practitioners, right? The education to become functional medicine trained is expensive. And many of these tests, unfortunately, are not covered by insurance yet, so it's out of pocket. So if money is an issue, $147 to join Dr. Tom and get three hours, <laughs> two to three hours for four weeks, of all this valuable information. I think that for people that right now can't afford to invest in it, to really dial in on sleep, sleep is so critical. Add in this mixture of veggies, really pump up to eight to nine cups of veggies a day, right, Dr. Tom? Yep, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And our friend, uh, Dr. Deanna Minnick, who coined the term rainbow diet, she recommends 50 different foods a week. 5 0. And I don't want anyone to go to the grocery store and throw 50 different foods in their cart because they're going to rot in the fridge. But you can start right. small, right? Make it into a game. Think about what you would, how you would make this fun for a seven or eight year old. So if you need a food chart with stickers, if you need different color pens to like put, all the orange food in an orange column, but just count up how many different foods you're getting in a week. And this includes veggies, fruit, uh, gluten-free grains, um, legumes, all the nuts and seeds and spices and herbs. We need to be sprinkling spices and herbs around like confetti on our food because they do have so many benefits um, for the body and for the gut microbiome. But then if you're, let's say you're getting 17 different foods in in a week. Awesome. Celebrate that and go for 19 the next week and make this realistic. Right. Right. 
Wait, let's go in and say, I haven't had bok choy in a while because I don't love it, but I can put it in my veggie smoothie and kiwi because I usually stick with bananas. I'm going to get some kiwi this time and some jicama, right? Just, I always like to say, do I have all the colors of the rainbow in my cart? And how much variety do I have? So I think that is so powerful. Extremely powerful. You know, there are basic foundational concepts that determine health or disease. And that's what I'm doing in the base hits is talking about these basic foundational concepts. Because uh, people don't know this. They're like, well, what do I take for this? No. How did this happen to me is the right question. So on the question about rheumatoid, as, I, as we're talking about Bach and the Bach flower remedies, rheumatoid patients can respond really, really well if they're will, willing to deal with the undercurrent anger that they have, their joints are inflamed. They're just, a, and it's so very common to see there was something in their life on the spiritual emotional side that's just as inflamed as could be, you know, causing this, uh, this suppressed emotions. They're on fire. And with rheumatoid, of course, also, um, the term is molecular mimicry. It's, it's um, talked about a lot in my book, The Autoimmune Fix, but people that have, um, uh, their immune system is fighting bacteria like Klebsiella or Proteus. Very, very often those antibodies fighting the Klebsiella or the Proteus will attack your joints and you, and you get rheumatoid. That's called molecular mimicry. So there are many different triggers, you know, as to what do I tell my friend about rheumatoid? Take base hits, understand the foundational issues that create disease. And when you've got that, then you know, okay, I need to work on this and then I, I need to work on this. I, need, I wish there was a pill that I'd be better tomorrow, but I understand it's gonna take a little time. I gotta do this, this, and this. And um, Mary Agnes came on and said that she's gonna post the link. Oh, she, she, she posted, there it is. Here's the link to our current live base hits. So for anyone that's interested in that. And with that, um, I have to excuse myself because I am on with Functional Medicine University in about 10 minutes. Uh, I'm doing a webinar for a few, I don't know how many hundreds of docs. And um, I've got to prepare for the couple of things I have to do. So M Michelle's gonna stay on for a few minutes, Michelle. Can sure. you do that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. And thank you everyone. I will see you next week. And Michelle, this was just too quick today. I mean. 48 minutes flew by. <laughs> Thanks once again, it's always a pleasure. Likewise, have a good evening. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Okay, let's see, next question is, um, Okay, is there any um, damage to the gut microbiome because there's alcohol in a tincture? This is Gabriella. That's a really good question, um, Gabriella. And that's when you gotta weigh the pros and the cons, right? So if there's, if you're working with a practitioner that said, okay, these tinctures are really critically important for helping to eliminate like a biocidin has a very small amount of alcohol and if you need to um continue or you need to take that because you have massive dysbiosis then i would say the benefits are going to outweigh any um of the harm of having the alcohol right but this is kind of a case-by-case -case basis so it's hard to say specifically for you. And I know that some of these remedies have like a really huge amount of alcohol in them, but um, sorry, that was a little ambiguous, but it's a tough question to answer. It's kind of a case by case um, basis of really weighing the pros and the cons. Amal, nice to see you. So did both Dairy Zoomer, which is cow dairy only and mammalian milk, which includes sheep, goat to camel and donkey i'm always curious like where do you even buy donkey milk like you can get camel's milk on um on the internet and um you know the others are sheep and goat are pretty common to be able to buy but i'm so curious 
type in a message to me if any of you know where to purchase donkey milk. But okay, so Amal did these. Um, she can't touch any cow or cow ghee, but dairy, goat dairy is fine. So she loves the Mount Capra culture goat ghee. That is such a great um, thing that you did, Amal, to really like sleuth out how you could have continued to have ghee and have the benefits of that ghee feeding the um, cells that line your the enterocytes, those cells that line your gut and finding one that was safe for you. So I love that. I'm also a practitioner, so she's pretty savvy in all of this. But I love how you um, really thought that through. That's great. And thanks for sharing. Um, what do you, so Steph is asking, what do you recommend for athlete's foot? My son has had it for several years and over the creams haven't helped. And that is because anytime we're manifesting mold or fungus on the skin, it's because um, there is mold or fungus systemically in the body or maybe in the gut, but it's coming from the whole body um, system. And our body has this amazing way of pushing any of these harmful things as far as way as they can from the essential organs. So once something's manifesting in the skin, it's likely been brewing for a while in the body. And so it's really important to address it internally. So, um, you know, many times doctors want to give these really harmful antifungals and they may be appropriate at certain times. I mean, I've work with people who have such severe fungal infections that they have to take them and have their liver tested once a week, but they're pretty tough on the liver. And many of them, you literally have to go in for a blood draw for liver enzymes weekly because they're hardcore, but there are so many products that can help to address um, elevation of yeast and, and fungal overgrowth. Diet is key. This likely he has cravings for sugar because um, fungus and yeast likes sugar to stay alive. That's its favorite food. So many people that have like an overgrowth of candida or yeast um, in their gut, or maybe they lived in a moldy house and now they have mycotoxins, they often really crave sugar and sweets to keep all of that alive. So really addressing it from um, the internally um, and then, you know, there can be things that can help with maybe the symptoms at the skin level. Um, like I've used the Biocide and LSF, um, just one pump and put a coating over um, toenails that are all distorted because of fungus or on a skin area. Um, there's pre and post pictures that we have of somebody that had a candida outbreak on their chin. And that was, you know, once it gets to the skin, it can be really embarrassing and people, you know, they can't, so many of these diseases are hidden and people don't realize that somebody's walking around just suffering. Um, but once it makes it to the skin and everyone can see it, that's when it can be really hard um, for somebody. But the LSF, um, the person was taking it internally as well, but just putting a coating on that fungal outbreak really helped um, to resolve that for them. Took about a month. You know, these things don't, they're not magic. I wish there were magic wands, but unfortunately um, they're not magic solutions. They can take time, but ultimately that's the goal. Like this didn't happen overnight. Um, your son had this vulnerability in his body and then he was exposed to probably somebody that he shared a shower with that, you know, at school or at a gym and then he maybe picked that up, but it's the vast majority of the time is it's a systemic issue. So I hope that helps. And let's see, we have a couple more before five. Um, let's see what else we have here. So what would you recommend for, I don't even know how to say this, it causes painful bumps. Um, I'm not sure, Kim, I would have to um, Google that and see what that even is. Um, Luann said she went to school to become a certified aromatherapist, one of the best things she ever did. So yeah, these essential oils can be really profound. 
Um, I have a service dog that is calibrated to detect um, gluten to um, 0 0.005 parts per million. That's amazing, Melissa. I um, got to meet my first gluten detecting service dog at a gluten-free restaurant about a year ago. And it's pretty amazing that they're training these dogs to do this. Um, so you were diagnosed in 2010 with celiac disease. I was only able to regain my health with him by my side in spite of my very best efforts to remain gluten-free. Just wasn't working for me. I had gone from knocking at death's door at 83 pounds to 110 pounds currently. First time in my adult life that I've been able to tip the scales in triple digits. Diagnosed celiac disease in 2010, the slightest bit of contamination was keeping me so sick. Not anymore, finally gluten-free. Thanks so much for sharing that, Melissa. That's amazing. And um, there's maybe some of you that like me that didn't even know that that existed, but um, there's people now that are training these dogs to help people like Melissa. Um, many of them were diagnosed with refractory celiac disease, kind of meaning like, this person is likely never going to get well. And I think that it's so critically important to remember that the human body has the most amazing capacity to heal. And for Melissa, she needed this dog to help her to be squeaky clean with her diet. She needed someone to be able to help her to detect gluten. You know, they allow 20 parts per million in um, of gliadin, it's this 33 amino acid chain in all of these gluten-free products. So people with celiac disease or a really strong gluten sensitivity, remember there's 70 genes associated with gluten sensitivity that we know of, at least 70. Um, so somebody could not have celiac disease and still have a really extreme gluten sensitivity and they're still getting enough gluten because if you're eating gluten-free cereal, um, gluten-free toast, cookies, crackers, and gluten-free pasta, then by the end of the day of eating all that processed food, you could easily be at 100 parts per million, and it could be what's tipping you over the edge to prevent you from getting well. This is one of the reasons I do a wheat sumer on myself, because I really try to avoid um, processed food, and I really highly recommend staying out of that gluten-free aisle. That is not food. It's food-like products with a lot of ingredients that are going to destabilize your blood sugar and, you know, wreak havoc. I see people with like sorghum sensitivities and they're like, I, I don't eat sorghum. I don't know where I'm getting this. There's sorghum in almost every processed gluten-free food in that aisle. So um, when we're eating all of this processed gluten-free food, it's really not doing us any favors. It's not real, whole, organic, nutrient-dense food. Um, so I think that's important to remember, you know, do a, a wheat sumer on yourself to see if your gluten-free lifestyle is working. And if it's lit up like a Christmas tree, then that could be the first step because not everyone can afford one of those dogs. I'm really glad Melissa was able to, um, but just know that there's always a next step, additional help. And um, we could be getting a lot higher dose um, than we realize by eating lots of processed food. Every single oat meal or processed oat that they tested that wasn't certified gluten-free contained detectable levels of gluten. So that's a gluten-free food, right? But somehow got contaminated in the processing and um, somehow along the way, it got con contaminated with uh, gluten from uh, wheat, rye, barley, spelt, or kamut. Okay, let's do one more even though we're at five. Let's see here. It's always so nice when I have someone in the background that's feeding these questions to me, but if you bear with me, um, let's see. Lisa says, I've had a lot of loss, daughter and son-in-law um, lost, a child, marriage issues, ended up in ER with brachycardia, then um, tachycardiac. I have a Christian counselor who now thinks I should take meds. I don't really want to take full time. I've taken box, but they, but have taken other meds to calm down. So Lisa, I think, you know, working with a functional medicine practitioner to get to the root cause. And sometimes um, I'm not a fan of medication unless it's 
like critically important, but sometimes people have to use band-aids. So working with like a functional medicine um, psychologist, there's a really awesome one in Sacramento. If you go to the ifm.org website and click on find a practitioner, search for all the practitioners in Sacramento and she's an MD um, and she's also a psychiatrist and she's gonna do all the Zoomer tests, screen for wheat Zoomer. You may have elevated levels of gluteomorphin proteinorphin, meaning gluten's parking on those opioid receptor sites in your brain and really impacting you neurologically. Uh, I just talked to a client who um, went gluten-free and seven months later, she's lost 35 pounds and all of her anxiety is completely gone. Now, it doesn't always work like that. I mean, it's awesome to celebrate when it does, but sometimes there's something underlying that maybe you haven't tried yet. And then I love that you're seeing a Christian counselor. That's awesome. And, you know, also doing tools like heart math, breathing exercises, um, making sure that every day you're doing something that brings you joy. I think that's so critical. I just look at the cycle that so many people get in and it's just this stress. They're just on this hamster wheel of stress of taking care of their kids and getting to work. And there's just no joy in the day. And like listening to your favorite song as you're driving to work or dancing around the house to music that brings you joy. Um, there's just talk your, to your Christian counselor about things that bring you joy and how you could fit those in um, so that you have experienced some, um, yeah, that's a lot. It's heart wrenching to deal with loss. And um, I mean, that I can't even imagine the loss of a child and a daughter and son-in-law and then to be in a marriage where it's, um, there's no joy in that, right? It's just stress. So um, if you need to, if you work with a functional medicine MD or psychiatrist that says, you know what, let's bring on band-aids for a band-aid right now to give you some relief um, until we figure out what's at the root cause. But the root cause of depression is not a Paxil deficiency, right? There's something going on, but sometimes pa Paxil is the only one I can think of right now of an antidepressant. Sometimes Paxil can be a Band-Aid to help somebody to get through. So you just have to work with somebody that can help you evaluate the big picture. Are you walking every day? Are you getting sunshine every day? So movement is so critical for, um, for all of that. And if you're, you know, eating really clean and doing everything you know how to do, then maybe taking a step further to help work with someone to get to the root cause. And if you have to take meds, don't beat yourself up. Okay. Like sometimes there's such a stigma attached to that. And the goal can be that it's just, you're using it therapeutically and it's not something that's going to go on indefinitely. Okay. hope that helped. All right, so uh, Sane said that Dr. Tom nailed the pronunciation. So that's great, I will let him know. And um, anyway, I'm gonna download these. Um, hopefully I can get all of these um, questions and hopefully we'll be able to start um, the next. So it's the first Tuesday of each month. So I hope that you join us then and we can continue questions or just Get those questions in, try to log in, write it 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern time and get your questions in first so we get to those. But it's just such an honor to have you here with us and thank you and sending all of you lots of love.